there was not going to be any entrance for for man and woman. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24. We've already considered this fiery, foreboding cherubim. But what was the cherubim holding? Well, we read that the cherubim was holding a sword. And that word sword there in verse 24 of chapter 3 means to lay waste, to make desolate. So there was a physical barrier, not only a physical barrier in terms of the cherubim, an expression of God's glory and his majesty, at least the garden. Yet this cherubim was wielding a sword, a destroying sword. There was going to be no access for man and his wife. But it's worth also looking carefully at that expression, the Garden of Eden, cherubim, verse 24, and a flaming sword. And if you look at um, several Hebraists, uh, they would argue, they would suggest that the word and should not be there. They argue that the word and uh, should be better rendered even. In fact, Brother John Thomas also suggests that rendering in Elpis Israel. Even a flaming sword. And so what we're being um, shown here, that the sword was a natural extension to the cherubim. Again, they were inextricably linked, the cherubim and the sword. So we have a cherubim, we have a sword, and a sword that is on fire. And it's almost as if the Hebrew is saying, that's one object. The cherubim, a sword and fire. Those three elements, those three pieces, make one active agent. Now why do I emphasise that, brothers and sisters? A cherubim with a sword and a flaming fire. Well, as we alluded to at the end of our first half, these were patterns patterns of reconciliation and restoration that God would educate the nation of Israel about. Let's go to the book of Leviticus and chapter 1. I'm going to be coming back to uh, the book of Genesis, but we're now going to thread together several threads that I feel uh, create quite a compelling picture of what is taking place here. Now Leviticus chapter 1 is the introduction really of the burnt offering where man could take of the cattle, of the herd, of the flock a a representative offering, an offering, a blood offering to represent them. This is why we as Christadelphians believe in the representative offering. Go back to Leviticus chapter 1 with your friends and show them how this is no substitute. It was to represent them. So let's just pick out a few ideas that are found here concerning um, this this burnt offering. Well, we see, um, halfway down verse 3, that it is to be without blemish, this uh, burnt offering. Um, You you also see here that um, certain actions were to take place, that uh, a man, as the head of his home, was to take of the cattle, the herd of the flock, uh, an offering that was to represent them, and then in the acknowledgement that they were a sinner, they were to place, in a very demonstrative way, they were to place their hand upon the head of this animal, and in that way they, they, were, they were conveying that they were worthy of death, and this animal represented them, and this offering was a voluntary offering. And we know concerning the burnt offering it was unique because it was flayed and it was cut in pieces and the fat and head and the body, they were all consumed upon the altar. That's why it was a burnt offering to God. As we went through those little details there in Leviticus chapter 1, think of that one picture, a cherubim with an extension of a sword that's on fire. And you turn a a few chapters now to chapter 9, and and we read of this little detail concerning the burnt offering. Chapter 9 and verse 24. Now when the burnt offering was placed upon the altar, where was the fire, brothers and sisters? Where did the fire come from? What was it? Aaron, and he was lighting some wood under the altar. We see something quite miraculous here about the burnt offering. 
Chapter 9 and verse 24. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. And the the burnt offering was so important because all was consumed, because the offerer uh, was saying that I give my heart and my soul and my body to the service of God. In many ways, brothers and sisters, it was the most important uh, sacrifice. And these details are unique to the burnt offering to convey to the offerer the import of what they were about to do. The offering was flayed, skinned, and was burned by a miraculous fire. Now with those thoughts, do you see in your mind Adam at the east of the garden? Of the things that he learnt in the garden, offering a burnt offering to his God. I do, brothers and sisters. He was so busy... In the Garden of Eden. And we will see he had overlooked something of paramount import. That resulted in both of them being evicted from the Garden. So he learnt his lesson. And he was now going to be busy, truly busy in the service of God. Can you see him then offering? A sinless, a, a blameless offering. At the east of the Garden. Where the cherubim with the sword would flay it. And would burn it and consume it. And it was an acceptable sacrifice of God. I can brothers and sisters. I believe here we see the glimpse of the burnt offering. And Adam was surely going to learn his lesson. How things had so quickly changed in his life. So to give that some thought. So so what we're saying here. We're seeing a little pattern. A little pattern of of God there, the Shekinah glory or the Shekan being placed in the east of the garden. And we're seeing a little pattern that's going to be replicated, is going to be picked up in the Aaronic priesthood. Where offerers come to the priest and they offer a burnt offering to God. And we're going to see so many more of these brothers and sisters. We're going to see that this is an extraordinary pattern. To remind the follower of God of what had been lost and what could be, through God's strength, be rediscovered. So we're going to look at a few words now. Uh, So come back then to to Genesis chapter 3. And um, when I was preparing these thoughts, it's a a really thrilling study to, to find these words and see how they're so beautifully connected. And then we're going to draw some lessons for ourselves. So, so come back then to, to Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to look at that well-known expression there. Um, to keep the way. There was the cherubim, to, to keep the way. Um, the words are on the overhead here. The, the Hebrew word is uh, shomar. Which means to keep, to guard, to keep watch, to protect, to even save life. So that's what the cherubim was doing. To keep The idea of protecting, to preserve. But it's also, brothers and sisters, picked up by the priesthood. Let's just pick out a a few words here. Come with me now to Numbers chapter 3. And as we go through and we connect these words, try and remember the picture we're trying to build. That There's a pattern that was established there in the garden. And the Lord God picks up this pattern and he runs it all the way through scripture. To remind all of us, brothers and sisters, of what had been lost. Paradise lost. And paradise rediscovered. Let's just look at this. So Numbers chapter 3 then. And uh, verse 10. And we're looking at uh, Aaron and his sons here. And thou shalt appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall wait on their priest's office, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. So there's the idea of the priesthood, Aaron and his sons, and they're they're protecting the the tabernacle. No one could have access into the tabernacle. We know that that was the sole responsibility of the Levites. Now look at that word, wait. Have a look in your margin. Some of you will have the word keep. It's the same word. It's the same word that's used of the Karen to keep the way. So here was Aaron and his sons, the priesthoods, the Levites. They were to preserve the way into the tabernacle. Because there God dwelt. 
in the most holy place, beyond the veil. So that's interesting, isn't it, brothers and sisters? There's a, there's a theme, there's a pattern, there's a thread. Well, we're going to see a, a drove of these in a moment. Uh, go over a few chapters to uh, chapter 8. And you might be thinking that we're taking these verses in isolation and it's not supported by further verses. For those of you thinking about that or thinking that way, be patient. Uh, and we're going to look at a collective sum of verses that really make the point. Let's look at uh, these verses very carefully. Uh, Numbers chapter 8 then and verse 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, This is it that belongeth unto the Levites. So the responsibility of the priesthood, very clearly made here. From twenty and five years old and upwards, they shall go in to wait upon the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. And from the age of fifty years old, they shall cease waiting upon the service thereof, and shall serve no more. But shall minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of the congregation to keep the charge, and shall do no service. Thus shalt thou do unto the Levites touching their charge. So in those few verses there, we have the responsibility there of the Levites. They were to start to work from 25 years and upwards to the age of 50. Various details are provided there, but look halfway down, verse 6. They were to keep the charge. That's the same phrase used in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24, to keep the way. So from the age of 25 to the age of 50, the responsibility of these Levites was to keep the the charge. They were to prevent access into the tabernacle, into the temple, because that was God's abiding place. As God abode, we will see, in the garden. Now you might be thinking, well, Brother Stephen, you, you've just picked out a few verses here. Let's look at this. I just choose Numbers, the book Numbers here. Um, and uh, it's, it's there very faintly. But let's just see in the book of Numbers how that word is used in Genesis 3, verse 24. And, and see if you can pick out um, the word keep with your eye. So Numbers 1, verse 53, the Levite shall keep the charge. Numbers 3, verse 7, they shall keep his charge. They shall keep all the instruments of the tabernacle. Numbers 3, verse 8. Numbers 3, verse 32, Aaron the priest shall be chief over the priests, the Levites, and have oversight of them that keep the charge of the sanctuary. This is a word that is used repeatedly regarding Aaron and his sons and the tabernacle. We go on. This is just the book Numbers. Eliezer, the son of Aaron, they shall keep the charge of the sanctuary. Numbers 3, verse 32. Uh, Numbers 3, verse 38. Keeping the charge of the sanctuary. Keep the charge of number 8. You can see how this is used repeatedly. This is a, a Levitical expression. Isn't that wonderful? So Moses, when he's writing these words, he would have known what he wrote in Genesis 3 and verse 24. And he chooses through inspiration to use the same word for Aaron and the priests of keeping the charge. A term that's used of the cherubim. Isn't that wonderful? One author, Moses here. He knew what he was doing. Why? Because this is a pattern. Garden of Eden was a pattern. It was going to be a pattern that was going to be seen later in the tabernacle and then later seen in the temple. Well, let's go on. So then, this tree of life, I want you just to, to imagine this. This tree of life, where was it? It was in the midst of the garden, wasn't it, brothers and sisters? And in the tree of life, what abode there? Everlasting life. It was in the midst of the garden. It was in the midst of the tabernacle. It was the most holy place. And what dwelt there? Immortality. God there. The Shekinah glory there dwelling between the cherubim upon the mercy seat. That's interesting, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Well, what's also quite interesting is that the door, we're going to see in a little moment, the door to the Garden of Eden, where was it? It was on the east. And the door accessing the tabernacle and the temple was to the east. Why? So that when the offerer, recognising their sin with their sin offering early in the morning, with the sun rising on the east, the sun, the natural sun was on their back, so that they could see with their own eyes the glory of God. And they were not blinded by natural light. So there's another little threat. The east of the garden, the east of the tabernacle. 
And as you approached the tabernacle and the temple, who were you greeted with? You were greeted by a Levite to take your offering. And where was the cherubim? In the east of the garden. So we've seen three elements um, associated with this garden. And they're all replicated in the tabernacle and the temple. So that's quite interesting, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Particularly if the exhortation... The exhortation for the offerer as he goes and he looks upon the tabernacle and he looks upon the temple, we're going to see he's being reminded of the Garden of Eden, I would suggest. Something that had been promised them. You may not have thought about it in that context, the tabernacle and the temple. It was a little replica of the Garden of Eden. And propitiation, a sin offering, atonement, was to take place outside the garden at the east, just as it would with the tabernacle and the temple. <coughs> Let's look at this cherubim. Come with me to uh, the book of Exodus. So there they were, they were greeted by a, a cherubim. At the east of the garden. And we're going to see that there were many cherubims in the tabernacle and the temple. All reminding the believer, the offerer, the son and daughter of God of what had been lost. Just going to uh, read a few verses. Well, let's read one verse here. Exodus chapter 26 and uh, verse 31 concerning the tabernacle. And thou shalt make a, a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen of cunning work with cherubim shall it be made. So there's Moses and he's been instructed by God. But he's already written Genesis. Don't you think he would be bringing to mind the Garden of Eden, brothers and sisters? Uh, keep a, a marker in the book of Exodus here because we're going to, um, we're, we're going to come back in a moment. But come with me to 1 Kings chapter 6 concerning the temple here. And we're going to see that these cherubims were not only on the veil and not only on the mercy seat. They were everywhere. They were carved into walls and doors and panels of the temple. There were cherubim everywhere as you look down. You were surrounded by cherubim. 1 Kings chapter 6 then. Verse 29. Just notice how many times you come across this idea of a cherubim in different parts of the tabernacle here and the temple. 1 Kings uh, chapter 6 verse 29. And he carved all the walls of the house round about with carved figures of cherubims. And palm trees and open flowers within and without. And the floor of the house he overlaid with gold and within and without. And for the entering of the oracle he made of doors of olive tree. The lintel and the side posts were a fifth of the wall. The two doors were also of olive tree. And he carved upon them carvings of cherubims and palm trees and open flowers. And overlaid them with gold. And spread gold upon the cherubims and upon the palm trees. And also made he for the door of the temple posts of olive tree. And a fourth part of the wall. And the two doors... Were a fir tree, the two leaves of the one door were folding, and the two leaves of the other uh, door were folding. And he carved thereon cherubims and palm trees and open flowers and covered them with gold fitted upon uh, the carved work. So we're seeing here that within the walls and the doors and the panels there was the cherubim. Why, why, brothers and sisters, why such an emphasis around this cherubim? Have a look at, uh, go back to Exodus chapter 15, uh, uh, 25, sorry. I, I said that we would go back there. Exodus chapter 25, just to round this little thought off. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 18, and it was similar within the tabernacle. There was no uh, clear distinction here. Verse 18 then. Thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one side, and the other cherub on the other. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings, and the high covering the mercy seat with their wings. And the faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. 
And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee, and there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the cherubim. So there was God dwelling in the cherubim, in the midst of the cherubim. So there's the idea of this cherubim. But we saw concerning the cherubim that was to be placed uh, within the temple, can you remember, uh, concerning its wings, the four wings, it, it, it uses the term in, in chapter 6 and verse 27, no need to go there, but it's the word stretched. These wings were stretched, those wings within the most holy place. They were stretched. And that word stretched means to entwine as a screen to fence in to protect. There's a lovely idea. These wings of the cherubim, we know that God's Shekinah glory dwelt upon the mercy seat. And as it were, the four wings of the cherubim were fencing in God's glory. Where's that idea seen before? Well, the idea was seen in the Garden of Eden with the cherubim. And the tree of life in the midst of the garden. There was no access. Those wings were outstretched. They were to protect God's glory and God's presence. So even in the various instruments and vessels and objects that were placed within the tabernacle and the temple, they themselves in isolation were reminding the believer of something that had been lost and could be restored. Can you see that? Even Not even looking at the tabernacle now. We're looking at a, an individual cherubim with the outstretched wings of 1 Kings chapter 6. And the lesson is exactly the same. There's a little detail. Come with me to... Um, I know we're, we're moving between Exodus and, and 1 Kings. But come back to the, the final time here, to Exodus chapter 25. And have you thought about this, brothers and sisters? Uh, the veil... The veil separated the most holy place and the holy place. And it was a thick veil. And in the holy place was the showbread. Do you know another word for the showbread? The showbread was right up against the curtain. Let's see um, what the showbread is called here. We're only looking at verse 30. Verse 30 then of Exodus chapter 25 and thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. Now, have a look in your margin. Some of you may have something like the revised version margin says, the present spread. The present spread. The idea of the bread right in front of the most holy place. The present spread. In the Hebrew, it literally means the bread of the faces. What a lovely idea that is. Because the cherubim on this thick veil could be seen within the most holy place. You could look upon the veil in the most holy place and you could see the cherubim. And what we're being told there, that in the holy place, on the other side, as you look to the veil, you could see the cherubim. And so then the showbread was the showbread of the faces. The faces of the cherubim. Again reminding the Levites here in the holy place, that they are separated from God. This is the showbread, the bread of fellowship. And they're separated from God. The bread of the faces, brothers and sisters. What a lovely expression uh, that is. The word veil, in the Hebrew, it literally means a separatrix. Something that separates one from, from another. That's the idea. That would be the purpose of a veil. Separation. And it comes from the root to break apart. Again, even with the veil itself, you're being told that you are separated from God. And it is a destroying veil. Because if the veil had been removed, then the Levite would perish. Certain uh, privileges were given on the Day of Atonement for only the high priest. But it was a destroying veil. And upon this veil were the cherubim. 
just as it was a destroying cherubim with a flaming sword at the east of the garden. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? It's the same thread, isn't it? The, the, the lesson is exactly the same. God is separated from man and he is a destroying power. And if we were left with just the law, brothers and sisters, how sad and how disheartening it would be. We thank our God for his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has made all things possible. But these are the lessons. These are the lessons uh, that were being brought out here. Did you notice something else as we read those verses? There's cherubim. There's cherubim everywhere. There's, there's cherubim on the veil. There's cherubim on the door. There's cherubim on the, uh, the carved walls. Cherubim everywhere to remind you of the cherubim in the East of the Garden. What else is um, specifically um, included within the tabernacle? Did you notice? Well, just look down. Look down from verse 31 and just go all the way down uh, to verse uh, 34. And as we look through these verses, pick out the mention of flowers. Uh, verse 31, at the end of verse 31, we, you, you come across the word uh, flowers there. Verse 33, notice almonds, flower, almonds again. Verse 34, almonds and flowers. Right? And what was this? This was the menorah. This was the seven branch lampstand. This was the, the light, the only light within the tabernacle. There was no windows in the tabernacle. There was no oil in the lamps. There was be utter darkness. And the things associated here with this light, brothers and sisters and young people, were flowers. And this was seen in the temple. Come with me to to 1 Kings chapter 7. Why, brothers and sisters, why were there so many flowers? Well, when we come to 1 Kings chapter 7, we don't just have almonds and flowers. We have pomegranates. Um... And not on the seven branch lampstands, we have here upon the pillars of the temple. So just look at the little section here. Uh, Verse 18 to verse 20. Let's just see if we can pick out the words. Verse 18, at the end of verse 18, pomegranates, notice. Um, Third line in verse 19, lily. And then once again you have two... um, mentions of the word pomegranates in verse 20. So we have lily and we have pomegranates and we've seen in Exodus chapter 25. And so brothers and sisters, as you came to the east, the eastern door of the tabernacle and the temple, and if you were given a line's eye view, what would you see? You would see flowers and you would see cherubim. Why? Why? Because you were being told that beyond that eastern door in figure was Eden. An Eden that you had not access to. But that was Eden, brothers and sisters. And beyond the most holy place, or beyond the veil in the most holy place, that is where God dwelt. This is why I believe all these little details are provided for us. Moses would have been acutely aware of this design. And he would have instructed the children of Israel in the importance of what they did. What a lesson, brothers and sisters. What a sobering lesson. So it wasn't just a ritual as they came each day with their offerings. They were being reminded of what God had promised them. They weren't just being reminded of their sins and the division between them and their God. God was reminding them every single day with that tabernacle and temple of what he had promised them from the foundation of the world. That they could dwell with him. They could inhabit a place where God resided. What an incredible blessing, brothers and sisters. What a tremendous source of encouragement. Come back to to Genesis chapter 2 now. We just want to now pick out a few words that we looked in our our first half and see their other meanings. Genesis chapter 2 then, and and here 
we've, we've already looked at this first. These were the responsibilities of Adam before sin entered into the world. And the Lord God took the man and he, he put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And we concluded that there was Adam before sin entered into the world. And he was already busy. But I want you to look very carefully at those words. So the first word then, to dress. To dress. And um, it's the Hebrew word, obad, which means to serve. To serve, brothers and sisters. So with the way that this, these talks are going, you're not going to be surprised that it means to serve as a priest. It's another thread that's picked up and given to the Aaronic priesthood and his sons. To serve as a priest. There was Adam in the garden, serving as a priest. Not really as a priest, brothers and sisters. That was going to be the pattern. He's serving as a priest. Now, I'm just going to illustrate this. And I'm just once again going to look at the book Numbers. And um, the, the word highlighted in red here is the same Hebrew word. And, and look how it's used. So Numbers 3 verse 7. And they shall keep his charge. Well we've already looked at that word keep haven't we? Genesis 3 verse 24. The cherubim shall keep the way. They shall keep his charge and the charge of the whole congregation. Before the tabernacle of the congregation. To do. There's the word. To do the service of the tabernacle. That's the word dress. You wouldn't see it, would you, in the AV? Same Hebrew word. Numbers 3, verse 8. To do the service of the tabernacle. So can you see that this is all about Aaron and the priests being busy in the tabernacle. And later in the temple in serving their God. There was Adam. He had the responsibility of serving as a priest. Serving his God in the garden. What wonderful lessons, brothers and sisters. Numbers 4, verse 23, to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. We go on. Numbers 4, verse 25, to, to serve and for burdens. Numbers 4, verse 26. In fact, it's repeatedly used in the chapter of Numbers, chapter 4. So then, what we find with the use of a concordance, there's a code. Come back to Genesis 2, verse 15. To dress and to keep. And if you look in a concordance and you put those two words together, suddenly you realise that those are the attributes of a priest. And they are always brought together. Look at this. Dress and keep. Numbers 3 verse 7. The verses, the verses we've already looked at, but they're not words in isolation. They're brought. They're companions of one another. These words in the Hebrew, to dress and keep, they're companions. They shall keep his charge and to do the service of the tabernacle. Numbers 3 verse 7. They shall keep all the instruments of the tabernacle and they do, shall do the service of the tabernacle. Numbers 3 verse 8. They shall keep the charge and shall do the service. Numbers 8 verse 26. Numbers 18 verse 7. Therefore thou and thy sons will thee shall keep your priests and ye shall serve. Can you see that brothers and sisters? Before we look at the overhead. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Another thread picked up. So there was Adam in the garden before sin entered the world. And we think about priesthood and we think about a, a serving God in a particular way, particularly in a, an ironic way, um, in relation to sin entering into the world. But there, Adam is serving in a particular way before sin entered into the world. That was God's design. He wanted true service from Adam. It wasn't Adam just casual and lazy and, and, and just uh, flitting his time, brothers and sisters, in the garden? Uh, and one day he's just not with his wife? No, it wasn't supposed to be designed like that. <coughs> he was to be serving his God each and every single day. This is why God says, now, priesthood in the tabernacle and we know if we had time do you know that expression warring the warfare in your in the mind have you come across that have a look in your rv where it talks about those that serve in the tabernacle look in your margin it's war the warfare in the mind as the as the levites went into the tabernacle in the temple they were warring the warfare in the mind there was a there was a conquest that was taking place and that's what god wanted adam to do in the garden conquest against what well we'll see that in a moment Let's carry on. What a beautiful expression that is in chapter 3 and verse 8. 
if there is ever an expression that describes God fellowshipping man. It's chapter 3 and verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. So there is God walking, in figure of course with his angels, walking in the garden. Have a look at what we've got on the overhead here. The, the, the Hebrew is described there. And uh, it comes from walking about and walking himself. And um, if we had time, you could go to 2 Samuel chapter 7, Leviticus chapter 26, Deuteronomy chapter 23. And they all describe God walking in the tabernacle and the temple. Isn't that wonderful? God chooses to describe how he fellowships man with walking. Walking in the tabernacle and the temple. So I want to pick out two examples. Come with me to Leviticus chapter uh, 26. And you're going to see how powerfully these words are being used. Of God walking in the garden. The same word is used. Of how God walked in the tabernacle. And how God walked in the temple. Uh, Leviticus chapter 26 then and, and verse 12. It's the same Hebrew word. And I will walk among you and will be your God and ye shall be my people and the the whole context of this is the construction of the tabernacle how God was going to walk with them as he resided in the midst of the camp within the tabernacle and he chooses to use the verb to walk so as Moses wrote these words he would have remembered wouldn't he he would have known because he recorded the words how God walked in the garden of Eden how God chooses to walk in uh, the tabernacle. Come uh, to that lovely chapter, 2 Samuel and chapter 7. Probably no surprise, is it really, that uh, God chooses to use this expression in this particular chapter. Concerning the promise to David, the Davidic kingdom, the royal seed. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 6. Whereas, God says, I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. So it's made now evidently clear that God walked in a tabernacle and later in a temple. God walked in the garden. There's the thread. Eden restored, brothers and sisters. Well, I, I do want to uh, pick out a few more details. Come back to, to Genesis chapter 4. Now, we've already looked at this scene concerning Cain and Abel. Remember how Abel's desire would be towards Cain. Abel's restoration would be subject to his elder brother. But there's a word used in verse 7 that just kind of jumps out of the narrative and there's no context at all. There's no introduction, is there? Because we're told that the caravan dwelt in the east of the garden. We're not, dis- we're not told at all about a door until we come to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. It, 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 caught, it kind of jumps out, doesn't it? Genesis 4 verse 7. If thou doest well, Cain, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Now, we know this verse so well. What door? <clears throat> We're not told about a door, are we? We're told about the east of the garden, the cherubim and the flaming sword that protected the way to the tree of life. It was a door. Ah, a door. Exodus chapter 12, and the blood upon the lintels and the doorpost. John chapter 10, I am the door. There's a theme. The door. So there was a physical door, physical door, there was a physical door, brothers and sisters, into the Garden of Eden. How can I be so confident about that? Well, the word uh, door, um, as you have here, um, means an opening, a, a doorway, an entrance. just want to see, um, have I got the details here? Yes, I have. Sorry. So, under bullet point four, if you look in a concordance and you trace that word door, again, no surprise that it has a a Levitical 
emphasis around the temple, temple and the tabernacle. So we have the door of the tent in Exodus chapter 26, the door of the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 29, the door of the temple in Exodus chapter 8, the door of the east gate of the Lord's house in Ezekiel chapter 10. The door. A door. So there was a door, brothers and sisters, to the east the tabernacle, to the east the temple, and it would have reminded the believer of the door of the cherubim and the blood that was sprinkled at the door because that's where the blood would have been sprinkled by the cherubim as he accepted the, the, the sacrifice. It would have been sprinkled at the eastern door. So, so what's the picture? I think that's the picture, brothers and sisters. That's what we have. So the picture on the overhead, you will be familiar with this because you would have thought that that's the tabernacle. What we've tried to superimpose there is the Garden of Eden. Cain was sent to the land of Nod. We have the land of Eden. We have the altar to the east of the gate of Genesis chapter 4. We have the cherubim. We have the holy place, which is the garden, which they didn't have access to. And then we have the tree of life in the midst of the garden. There's the pattern, there's the structure. A replica. Not a replica for a replicless sake, brothers and sisters. It's not a pattern for just academic completeness. It's an exhortation. To all of us, brothers and sisters, when we look at the tabernacle and we look at the temple... It's God's means of restoration. It is my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus? So, as we look at the tabernacle and we look at the temple and we can uh, get so involved in the details and that pharisaical attitude of how man breached God's law and he was separated from God, there's a lovely undercurrent to all of this. That in all of this, brothers and sisters, in all these Levitical designs, God is extending his hand of salvation to you and to me and to our brethren. Come back to Genesis chapter 3. We're just going to uh, pick out a few points and then we'll conclude. What do you think about Adam? We often just emphasise, don't we, that there was the first Adam and the second Adam and one brought death and the other one brought life. I think that could be grossly unfair. How would you have felt, brothers and sisters, in this feeling of peace and then suddenly you are subject to this cherubim and you've lost everything? You've even lost your life. And sentence has come forth. What a What a fearsome thing that must have been to experience that. Look at the response of Adam. Brothers and sisters, if we ever think about the the failings of Adam, please bring to mind Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20. As soon as the sentences have come forth from the lips of Almighty God, it's almost as if there's not a pause. The penny's dropped with Adam. And Adam, chapter 3 and verse 20... (coughs) Called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Can you see? He'd listened to Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. A a verse that we all know. Concerning the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent. And he looks to his wife. And he sees that within her. God had granted the ability to have a seed. And there would come forth the promised seed. That would vanquish sin and death. What an extraordinary statement of faith. Would your minds have been there brothers and sisters? Would my mind have been there after I had listened to the sentence of almighty God and been cast out? And if there's any doubt about this brothers and sisters. Look at the end of verse 20. Because she is the mother of all living. Dying thou shalt die. And suddenly, Adam summons within himself this faith, and he says, within her and the seed of promise, a seed will come that will destroy the seed of the serpent, will crush it in the head. 
She is the mother of all living. What an extraordinary statement of faith, brothers and sisters. An extraordinary statement. Adam was a special man. But he forfeited it, didn't he? He forfeited those responsibilities, didn't he? Just, just think what happened. If he's there in the garden and the priesthood was going to be later patterned of him, what was he protecting? Have you thought about it? He had the responsibility in the garden to protect. From what, brothers and sisters? He was perfect, wasn't he? There was a serpent there. And though the serpent was good, it was beguiling. And though there was no sin, and though there was no moral conscience with that serpent, God knew that there was an ability for sin to be brought into the earth. And Adam had the responsibility as a a priest in type to protect his wife and himself from the power of the serpent. How profound is that? And so then, when the woman was actively engaged in a conversation with the serpent, where was Adam, brothers and sisters? Though he was a remarkable man of faith to make the statement that he's just made, where was he? And you contrast the second Adam. There wasn't a moment that that man was not engaged. And he destroyed the power of sin by crushing the head of the serpent. Can we see the contrast? And now Jesus Christ, off that pattern, a high priest, but after the order of Melchizedek. What wonderful threads. One final thought. The beauty of the Garden of Eden. The beauty and the splendour and the marvel and the majesty of the Garden of Eden. And so then, if the tabernacle and the temple were designed off the Garden of Eden, then clearly the temple, in all its splendour, one of the wonders of the world, it was incomparable with the beauty of Eden, wasn't it? Even the temple in all its glory, later Herod's temple. It couldn't compare with the beauty of Eden. Come with me finally to the book of Revelation. Because this was all going to change. A man would come. A man promised in the garden. A man who was going to give access to all of us through faith into the garden. And though the tabernacle and the temple were just mere, almost ugly, if I may say, replicas of what God created in the beginning. When we come to the final chapter of Revelation, we see something that supersedes. Something that excels the original garden. How can I say that, brothers and sisters? Well, let's just uh, read this section together. This paradise. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it, and either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. Not the curses in the garden, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. Now, we've we've quickly gone to Revelation chapter 22. Where is the detail that tells us that this is a garden that supersedes, not like the tabernacle or the temple, this supersedes the original design? For one clue, there's no curse. The lamb is in the earth. Not the lamb that was shed in the garden that died and could only evict man from the garden and and created this separation between God and man. This is a, a lamb that brings followers to God. But there's something else, isn't there? 
there was the tree of life on either side of the river Zulon, wood brothers and sisters when we look at the original garden in all its magnificence in all its beauty if I may use this expression there was merely one tree of life just one and it was in the midst of the garden why brothers and sisters why was there only one because it spoke of the promised one to come the single seed Jesus Christ there in figure in the midst of the garden but as Paul tells us that single seed becomes a multitudinous seed and brothers and sisters when we look at Revelation chapter 22 and verse 2 that single tree has become a wood a multitude a multitude that no man can number. And if that's the case, it's excellent, isn't it? It supersedes the Garden of Eden. Isaiah chapter 61 that talks about the trees of righteousness that God will plant by his river. We see ourselves in all these lessons, in this restoration, this this process of reconciliation and restoration is now complete. Let's just read finally, just a few verses, and we'll draw our thoughts to a conclusion. Look at these words. They're words of appeal, aren't they, brothers and sisters? In this little place here this evening. They're words of appeal. What a privilege that we have that we can serve Almighty God. Verse 7. Finally, behold, Jesus says, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Verse 12. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. And may enter in through the gates into the city. Thank you.